hello, gentlemen, and my best wishes to all of you. That's, that's very kind. Thank, Thank you. you for all your hard work. Your work ethic is admirable. Uh, I wanted to know if you could talk about the different storage options you use when working on projects, as I have noticed that your video files you produce are on the bigger side. Do you use a lot of solid state technology when working? Thank you, and please take care. Um, I'm not quite sure what, how you work, Oliver, so I'm quite interested in, uh, in, in how you produce this, because our workflow is obviously... 100% PC based yeah. using Adobe Premiere. And that includes like plugins that enable us to plot our FPS graphs mm -hmm. and whatnot. Whereas you uh, work on Mac with Final Cut Pro, as I That's understand correct, it. Yeah. But what, yeah, what is the, um, uh, the, the storage implications of the files that we're dealing with here? Yeah, they're, they tend to be pretty big. Um, but for me, I, I work off of a Mac studio with an eight terabyte SSD. So I have quite a lot of sp okay. space for that stuff, but I also like to keep lots of projects on there at once. So I have lots of material and if something gets referenced in a DF direct itself to go back and find it. So that has some um, work implications for me, but yeah, I just, I work off of uh, that computer and um, I archive on hard drives and uh, I just take, I have my capture computer back there. I take all the stuff from that computer, I encode it. I get all the framing information off from rendered uh, video files off Premiere. And I work that way, so that works for me. But yeah, how do you transfer them over to the Mac? Uh, just using a, a pocket SSD. But yeah, I'm. Uh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. I'm mostly on that on that eight terabyte internal SSD, and and that's very high bandwidth as well. It's it's a very fast SSD, as you might expect. Is it possible to do easy fire while sorry, <laughs> wired transfers over the network from Mac OS? Yeah. to uh, yeah. Windows PCs? I haven't done it in a long time. It used to be. Yeah, this this way seems to work okay. I'm not transferring an enormous yeah. amount. It's not, it's not too inconvenient, but I could do it over lots of things. could do it over Ethernet. could do it a million different ways. O over the network and under the curtain. Uh, yeah, under, under, the curtain. Uh, under the covers or under the curtain, is, as maybe so. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, just to give an idea of what, what happens, basically, uh, we want the best quality in terms of captures from start to finish, right? But um, back in the day with Digital Foundry, we used uh, mathematically lossless compression. So 720p, that would be okay, right? Um, the files would be, I think, sort of uh, typically 30 to 100 megabytes per second. and But that is still very, very large. But the point is that you kept the quality from start to end and um, and then the only quality hit was when you went on the the, uh, the export and the upload to, to YouTube. Um, but moving to 4K, we have moved to lossy codecs um, simply because when you're dealing with 4K files or even 1080p, if you're being honest, uh, some of these lossy codecs can be really, really good quality. And you don't really, bearing in mind the amount of compromise there is at YouTube at the other end, it, you don't really see it. Uh, so that kind of makes right. sense, but yeah, it, so, you know, the, in terms of file sizes, even at 4k, I think we're talking about like sort of anything from 50 megabyte per second up to like 300, depending on the complexity of the content. Uh, that is pretty big. Um, I'm not sure which files Shalon Ogden is referring to here, uh, whether he's talking about the videos downloaded from df.net, but even they are actually very compressed compared to the internal files that we use. Yeah, and nice. yeah, I've got like a couple of um, four terabyte NVMe drives. I've got a four terabyte SATA SSD, and I've also got an eight terabyte SATA SSD because, you know, if you the more material you have, the better you edit generally, but also it means that you need a lot more space. And then in terms of storage at the back end, once the project is done, I use NVENC to uh, compress the file down still further, um, but with very short keyframe intervals so that footage can still be used in an editing environment. It's kind of like a good backup solution. Right. Alex. Yeah. Similar setup to Rich. Uh, Rich provided me with a great four terabyte scratch disk, which I use to do most of my recording. And as long as it is um, we're using Cineform typically, if I'm using Cineform, it can cover the entire game. Like, I can record for so long in Cineform quality at 4K using that 4 terabyte. Uh, but for other things, like when I do 4K 120 hertz capture, Cineform doesn't isn't great. So I use Magic YUV there. 
Um, and the, the size of that is huge. So yes. I have way less space. <laughs> Um, so then I have to start juggling internally with other drives that I have, uh, to offload some footage. Sometimes I also, in the middle of a project, when I realize that I'm capturing multiple games or I'm capturing 4k 120. And I think actually for, for example, if I'm showing a game in B roll, I want it usually in pretty high quality, but if I'm showing performance capture footage with the overlay in front of it. I actually allow myself it to be more compressed because I say it's be what you're caring about is the frame time graph and less about the quality of the visuals. Yeah. So sometimes in the middle of a project, I will uh, do some other encodes, usually NVENC, uh, in a way that is good on the timeline and it shrinks the file size usually in half or even more. Uh, then after I finish a, f uh, a, f a video, I don't re encode all of my B roll always. What I do is I take specific spots of it, as well as uh, any of the performance capture specific stuff I did where I did like benches, and then I'll <clears throat> encode them into a compromised NVENC, just like Rich does, and I store them away on SSDs. Yeah, it's so. worth pointing out that we talk about compromised uh, video quality, but you won't see it on YouTube for sure. It's still better than YouTube. It's, it's, it's still it's better than still YouTube. It's still like an order of magnitude better than YouTube compression. So, you know, you, you typically won't see it. And we do need a storage solution that does actually produce workable uh, files that you can, you know, back up without having mm -hmm. to spend, yeah. you know, $300 on a 20 terabyte drive every month. Yeah, and, and like, for, <laughs> but, you know, right. for, for reference, like well, even off a pretty compressed NVENC file, you can easily do like pixel counts and stuff like that, like super fine. <laughs> like oh, yes. the detail still preserved yeah. to, especially like silhouette, like all this stuff, silhouettes and stuff like that. It's Silhouettes are still great. It's still, it's still yeah. preserved yeah. quite a lot. Um, and especially for YouTube, I mean, YouTube is brutal to our videos. You would not believe how bad it is relative to what you see on the timeline or what you would see with, uh, certainly with one of the downloaded videos off df.net, right? Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes Linus puts out videos on his mammoth storage solutions. And uh, this is just like, I mean, we, we're using essentially consumer level, maybe not quite in the terms of Oliver's Mac Studio. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it's consumer level hardware, which uh, and consumer level storage solutions that we've had to adapt our workflow to to work with that. Um, and yeah, so the concept of having these massive server farms, it's just you know we're just using off the shelf parts really. There's nothing crazy or you know enterprise no. level about it.